transportation spectrum that you're dealing with a transition from the V equals zero, so V double prime is zero to the V prime equals one. And so transitions which occur in the infrared for a diatomic molecule will generally involve a change in V and J, right? Vibrational and rotational energy. And what did we say the the uh, these line positions um, a spectrum would typically look like this where you have this center of your band is called your band origin omega naught and that's just the change in your vibrational energy so G of V prime minus G, minus G minus the vibrational energy for the lower state V double prime would be equal to your omega naught, right? This is going to be g of 1 minus g of 0, and that's where your band origin is, okay? And then we said the fine structure in your spectrum has to do with changes in the rotational energy. We said uh, the bands over here at low frequencies, low wave numbers, this is what you call your P branch, and you're dealing with delta J equals negative one. So there's a, there's a decrease in the quantum number J. So from, for example, if you go from J double prime equals one, you end up in J prime equals zero for this first line right here. So this is from one to zero, okay? And from J double prime equals two, you end up where? You end up with J prime equals 1. So this is from 2 to 1, this second line right here. And on the right side, at high wave numbers, you have what you call your R branch. Okay. And the change in the rotational quantum number is positive 1. Right. So this goes from J equals 0 to J equals 1. This line corresponds to the transition from J equals 1 to J equals 2, from J double prime 2 to J prime 3. And this fourth line right here is from J double prime 3 to J prime equals 4. Okay? And those line positions correspond to your, um, uh, the line positions would be omega naught plus f of j prime minus f of j double prime, where f of j prime and f of j double prime are your rotational energies for the upper state and the lower state, okay? So we talked about the formula we can use to calculate these uh, line positions. So now let's talk about the relative intensities of these positions. Why, why is this thing right, right here more intense than this line right here, for example? So just like in the rotational spectrum, okay, uh, the intensity of the lines depend on the probability that the transition will occur and the relative number of molecules in a particular v, prime, v double prime, J double prime level. So in other words, it depends on how many molecules there are and the concentration of the molecules that can absorb at that transition and the probability that that transition will actually occur. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and go to that web uh, page. Okay. So we start over here. All right, so how to explain the relative intensities? There are two factors to consider. The first factor is the probability that that J prime, that particular J prime, J double prime transition will occur. And it's proportional to the square of the transition dipole moment, okay? And it turns out, okay, that for P branch lines, that turns out to be uh, 
given by what we call the honnell london factors okay so you can derive that well maybe you can't but, uh, but we, we won't we're just going to use the formulas as, that have already been derived for us okay so the probability for p branch lines is given by j prime plus lambda not, times j prime minus lambda divided by j prime. Okay? For, uh, for our branch lines, okay, the probability depends on, is, is proportional to j prime plus lambda times j prime minus lambda over j prime. And for our branch lines, ah, oh, that was that's the same. That was the same one I circled. Okay, that's the p branch lines. For the r branch lines, it's j prime plus one plus lambda times j prime plus one minus lambda over j prime plus one. Okay, you might be asking, what is lambda? What is this capital lambda right here? That's similar to cap big L for your uh, atoms. Okay, except that that would be the quantum number for the component of the total orbital angular momentum. By the way, this is the formula for the Q branch, if there's a Q branch. Okay, um, so 2J prime plus 1 lambda squared over J prime times J prime plus 1. Okay. So what is lambda? This capital Greek letter lambda is a quantum number for the component of the total electronic orbital angular momentum along the internuclear axis. So if you have a diatomic molecule, okay, you have that axis right there, internuclear axis, so that line right there. If you take the component of, let's say, this is your angular, total angular momentum of your electrons, okay, then the component of that is going to be lambda h bar. Okay. Oops. Oh, okay. Hold on. The component of that orbital angular momentum along the inner nuclear axis is lambda h bar. So it's similar to m sub l. Okay. So that depends on what the quantum state is of the molecule okay so the electronic state okay the electronic state of diatomic molecules can be labeled by the letter greek letter sigma okay pi and delta if you remember for atoms we can uh, specify the total the quantum state depending on the total orbital angular momentum using letters okay uh S, P, D, F, right? Well, if you're dealing with diatomic molecules, you use Greek letters. So you use sigma instead of S, pi instead of P, delta instead of D, phi instead of F. And so when you look through Hertzberg's tables at the NIST website, okay, the lambda is implied in the name of the ground, st the ground state. So for example, okay, if the name of the electronic state says something sigma, that means lambda is equal to zero. Okay? That means the component of the electronic angular momentum along the internuclear axis is zero. It's like m sub l equals zero. Okay? If the electronic state is a sigma state, then lambda equals one. If it's a delta state, then lambda equals two. Okay? Now, if you'll notice, if your, you have a sigma state, okay? If your ground state is a sigma state, your lambda is equal to zero, and what do you notice in the formula for P, Q, and R? What happens when lambda equals zero for the Q branch? For the Q branch lines, if lambda is zero, then the probability that you'll see a P branch, a Q branch is zero. And that's why in that, in typical exa example that I've been giving you, there is no Q branch, okay? You don't see any Q branch. This is when you're dealing with 
transitions within a sigma electronic state. So you only have a P and an R branch. But if you have a non-sigma state, like uh, we, earlier we saw one, the nit nitric oxide, the NO molecule. If, if you remember, we looked, we looked, we looked up the molecular constants for that, and we found the ground save us a pi state, doublet pi state, and so there's a, you're going to expect to see you'll expect to see a Q branch there because lambda is not zero. So Q branch do not show up if you have sigma states. Okay. So let's take a look at these molecules right here. So I'll go, let's go to the webbook.nist.gov, the NIST website, and determine which of the following molecules will show a Q branch within the ground electronic state. Actually, I just gave you the answer earlier. What's the answer to this one? Which one of these will have a Q branch? The NO. Okay. And let's go ahead and look it up anyway. Uh, so you go to webbook. .nist.gov and when you get there click on chemistry workbook and do a search enter the formula what are the molecules that we need to look up we need to look up HBr let's look up HBr Constants of diatomic molecules, check that, and HBr right here. You have a deuterated version and a regular HBr. If you scroll down to the bottom, what is the ground state? What is the X state for HBr? You'll find that it's a sigma state, okay? It's a singlet sigma plus. Singlet is the same thing. It's, it's called the multiplicity. It's the same multiplicity we it's due to spin. The same thing we talked about when we talked about um, uh, multiplicities for atomic energy states. Okay, uh, plus has something to do with the symmetry of the wave function. We'll get to that later. Okay, you know, when we get to molecular structure. All right. So that's a sigma state. So if there's a sigma state, do you expect to see a Q branch? No Q branch. Okay. So you do the same thing, you do a search for all the others, and you should be able to find that of all these, it's NO that has a pi state, that is not a sigma state. In fact, let's do that for uh, NO. So if I do a search for NO, search, scroll down to the bottom. The ground state of NO is a doublet pi state. So you would expect in the vibration rotation spectrum for NO, you would expect to see a Q branch. Okay. All right. So the answer to this question, which one will show a Q branch? That's going to be NO. So you see. Okay. Correct ground, the ground electronic state of NO is a pi state. All right. Now, if you examine the line strength factors again, you'll find that the intensity of the P and the R branch generally is generally proportional to J prime at very high J prime levels, whereas the intensity of the Q branch lines is inversely proportional to J prime at high J prime levels. Let's take a look at that. What happens at very high J? Okay. At very high J, what will this be approximately equal to? This will just be negligible and that will be negligible, right? So that's going to be J prime squared over J prime. And so that's just going to be proportional to J prime. So the probability increases at high J prime. Same thing over here. This is going to be approximately one. That would be negligible. It will be directly proportional to J prime plus one. Okay? 
So uh, it's proportional to J prime. Can you say that the one language Yeah, you can say that. So it's proportional to J, basically. Okay. And if you look at the Q branch, on the other hand, what do you see? At high J primes, what happens? You're going to have, this is approximately 2J prime, right? And the bottom is just going to be approximately J prime squared. The one is going to be negligible. So that's approximate well, that, yeah but j prime squared plus j prime right if you right. if you distribute that well when when your j prime is very large the square will be much larger than the than the the unsquared term so that's just going to be j prime squared approximately at the bottom so that's inversely proportional to j prime so at high j primes the uh, Q branch line intensities, the probabilities for those lines will diminish. Okay? So, these transition probabilities expressed in terms of J prime and lambda are known as the line strength factors or the Honol London factors. Also known as the line strength factors. So, that factor tells you the probability that the transition will occur. The second factor to consider is how many molecules you have in the lower state that can absorb the photon. So that's the second factor, and that's basically the same uh, population factor that we saw when we looked at the rotational spectrum. So let's go on to the next question. Okay. Factor number two depends on the number of molecules in the initial J double prime state. So you can see here you have a degeneracy factor. For each given J double prime, how many M sub J's can you have? So for example, if J double prime is three, how many M sub J's can you have? Seven, right? right? So three to M sub J can be three, two, one, zero, negative one, negative two, negative three. So two J plus one. So this is your degeneracy factor. Okay. Now, the exponential term, again, the higher the energy okay, of a quantum state, the fewer the molecules you expect there at a given temperature. That's your Boltzmann factor, e to the minus f over kT, where f is the rotational energy. But it's possible to have more molecules in an excited energy levels because you have to also take into account that the higher the J, the more quantum states you have. Okay. So, if we were to compare, for example, in this question, you're asked to compare the relative intensity of this two these two lines right here. Okay. So, transitions from V double prime zero, J double prime equals nine. So, and this is uh, zero nine. Okay, so V double prime equals zero. If you're particularly interested in J double prime equals nine. Going to at the V prime equals one level, J double prime equals ten. J prime equals ten. Okay. Is that a P R or Q branch line? Going from nine to ten. Delta J here is plus one. So you, you need the line strength factor for the R branch line. Okay? And you're going to compare that with this other transition right here. Uh, the other transition you're comparing it to is from, again, this is from V0. So it's V0 to V1, so let's just ignore the Vs. Okay? So... You're comparing J9 to J10 versus J0, J double prime 0 to J prime equals 1. Okay? Is that P or is that also is that a P branch or an R branch? That's also an R. So you're comparing the R, the first R line, right? 
to the 10th R line. Okay, so this is, uh, remember your R branch lines look like this. So this is uh, J double prime equals zero. And then you have, the, you have the ninth line somewhere back here. J double prime equals nine. You're going to compare the intensity of this to the intensity of that. So how would we do that? So in this particular case, you are to assume that your uh, you have a rigid rotor with rotational constant of 5.3, okay, 5.3 reciprocal centimeters, and your temperature is 345 Kelvin, and your Boltzmann's constant, okay, if you recall, is 0.695 reciprocal centimeters per Kelvin. So how do we compare your relative intensities? Let's do that on MathCAD. So we need to compare. We need to compare N for J prime equals J double prime equals nine, right? To the population of J J double prime equals zero, right? So that's going to be equal to what? 2 times 9 plus 1 oops, times e to the negative, what's our b? I'm just going to type b here. b times 9 times 10, bjj plus 1, right? Over k times t, right? What's our b? What did we have for our B? 5.3. B is 5.3. Our K is 0.695. Our temperature is 345. Okay. And so this expression right here, that's 2J plus 1 e to the negative f of 9, which is b times 9 times 10, b j, j plus 1, over k t. So the denominator would be, what, 2 times, what's the j double prime? 0 plus 1 times e raised to the power negative b times 0 times 1, b j, j plus 1, over k times t, right? So that's the ratio, the population ratio. So let me copy that and let me calculate that. The population ratio is 2.599. What does that mean? That means in J equals zero, if I have one molecule here, uh, let's make that 1,000 molecules here. How many molecules? So J double prime equals zero. How many molecules will I have in J double prime equals nine? 2,599 molecules are going to be there. Okay. Now, if you're going to, if you're just going to compare, okay, uh, this ratio right here, the Boltzmann terms. Okay, let me rewrite this. If I were to take out the degeneracy factor, okay. If I'm just going to compare the Boltzmann factors, you'll notice, okay, this number is less than one. There's fewer molecules in each quantum state at J double prime equals to one, nine. Okay, for each of the M sub J's here, there is fewer molecules compared to the one in the ground state. But because you have so many of these, how many, how many of these states do you have at J double prime equals nine? 2 times 9 plus 1. You get 19 of these states, right? So it's really 19 times 0 0.137. What's 19 times 0 0.137? 19 times 0 0.137. You have about 2.6. Okay? 
So I'm at, that's 2.5999. I think there might be some runoff uh, problems there. There's 19 of them. Each one of them doesn't have as much population as the ground state. The ground state, okay, has the most, for any of those quant rotational quantum states, the ground state has the most population. But in the J double prime equals nine, there's 19 of them. Each one few with a fewer number of molecules compared to the ground state, but if you count all 19 all together, so 19 times 0.137, you still get more than uh, more than the ground the ground level. Okay, uh, that 2.603 and 2.599 that's a round of error there. If I multiply this by 19, I should get 2.599. Yeah, okay. okay? So there's fewer molecules in an excited state, but an excited level has a higher degeneracy. There's more ways a molecule can be in an excited energy level. That's why you have a higher population there. Okay? That's generally true if the temperature is high enough and the spacing between the allowed energy levels are small enough. That could happen. Now, in the case of vibrational energy levels, the gaps are so big, okay, and the genesis are all the same. They're all one anyway. So in, for vibrational energy transition, it's mostly from V equals zero. Okay. So it's 2.6, 2.599, just based on the population factor, okay? Just based on the number of molecules, you would expect the J equal, J double prime nine transition in the R branch to be 2.6 times stronger than the first R line. But you have to take into account the line strength factor also, the probability that it will happen. So what's the probability that it will happen? Let's scroll down. And so let's take a look at our line strength factors for the R branch. What are the line strength factors for the R branch? Right here. This is the line strength factor for the R branch, right? And it's basic. It, for sigma state, what is uh, what is lambda for sigma state? Zero, and that is zero. So J prime plus one, J prime plus one, over J prime plus one. That's just going to give you J J prime plus one. Right? All right. So what would happen now? You're going to compare J prime plus one for the two transitions, right? So for J prime plus one for J double prime equals nine versus J prime plus one for J double prime equals zero. Okay, so what's J prime plus one here? J prime, it is an R branch, right? So J prime is 10. So you're going to compare 10 plus one versus, okay, if J double prime is zero, what's our J prime? One. So you're going to compare 10 plus 1 versus 1 plus 1. And what's 10 plus 1 versus 1 plus 1? That's 11 over 2, 5.5. So this means that it's 2.6 times stronger because of the population and another 5.5 times stronger because of the probability. So what's 2.599 times 5.5? It should be 14, about 14.3 times more intense, that absorption line for the R9 line. Okay? And let's see if we have that choice among the choices given. Oh, it's not there. Okay, this may be one of those. Uh... Um... Okay. 
just maybe one of those errors in the tutorial that I forgot to fix. <laughs> okay, so it's going to be, let me see if I assume it was for quantum state. Um, what if I have, what if I were to divide by instead if, instead of five point if two point five nine nine what if I just use point one three seven times five point five point seven five four still not one of the choices okay so I think I made a mistake here somewhere in the programming of this tutorial okay so let's just pick any answer here yeah says so you're guessing <laughs> Calculate the probability and n for both and take the ratio. Let's see, set b. I got the ratios reversed, so it's 1.5 d. Okay. All right, so you need to use the formula for the r branch lines and j prime minus j double prime is equal to. So I made a mistake there somewhere, but that's how you would work it out, the relative intensity. Next question. How are, we how are we going to analyze our data? Well, let's just assume we have the simplest possible case where the rotational energy is just, we'll just use the rigid rotor formula. So the upper J would have F, F of J prime would be just B1, J prime, J prime plus one. What is this one right here? And that's for V equals one, okay? And this is B for V equals zero. J double prime, J double prime plus one. All right. Now it's fairly straightforward. Okay. And there are there are many ways you can come up with V one and V zero, but the most straightforward way, using uh, given what we had the tools that we have now. In the old days, they have diff uh, different techniques that you can use to extract these numbers out easily. Uh, but you have to do some manipulations. But with the availability of Excel, it's a very simple problem. This is basically a linear regression problem. So what you do in Excel is, okay, you tabulate your line positions, you create a column of values for J prime, J prime plus one, and you create a column of values of J double prime, J double prime plus one. And if you do a regression, this is gonna be your intercept, omega naught, okay? And B1 is going to be the coefficient of J prime, J prime plus one. And negative B0 is going to be the coefficient of J double prime, J double prime plus one. All right? So if you did that, let's see what, we'll, what we get. Here, here's a setup on Excel, okay? Uh, so you tabulate your line positions, assign those to J prime and J double prime. Identify the J prime and the J double prime for those, okay? Then create a table of J prime times J prime plus one. How did I get the zero right here? This is zero times zero plus one. And how did I get this two? That's one times one plus one. How do you get this six right here? That's two times two plus one. So that's the column of J prime and J prime plus one. Then you tabulate J double prime times J double prime plus one. So how did I get this two right here? This is J double prime, which is one, 1 times 1 plus 1 is 2. And then to get 6, that's 2 times 3. And this 12 is 3 times 4. Okay? So if you did that, you set, set, up, set, that, set up your columns that way. You can do a regression. So you go to your regression tool in Excel, and you specify, okay, your Y range, your input Y range would be in this particular case, C2, column C, row 2 to row 11. So C2 to C11. And then your input X range would be, OK, 
okay, this one right here, D2 to E11, these two columns, the column of J prime, J prime plus one, and J double prime, J double prime plus one. So that's your X range. Okay, make sure this box right here for constant is zero is unchecked because you do not want to force your intercept to zero. Your intercept is going to be your band origin. So once you've assigned your J prime, J double prime to your transitions and you've, you've, you've identified the line positions L, then you specify where you want to put your output and this is the kind of output you would get. So in this particular case, here's the intercept, 2700. The coefficient of X variable one is 3.78. This is the coefficient of what? J prime j prime plus one and this is negative 4.01 the coefficient of variable number two that's the coefficient of what j double prime j double prime plus one okay so from the data shown here what's the rotational constant b0 what was our formula line position equals omega naught plus B1, J prime, J prime plus one, minus B0, J double prime, J double prime plus one. So what's, what is B0 then? What is B0? The coefficient of J double prime, J double prime plus one is negative B0. So negative 4.01 is negative B0. So what is B0? Positive 4.01, okay? So that's how you figure that one out. Four point zero one. the answer is D, okay? So the coefficient of J double prime, J double prime plus one is negative B0. You found it to be negative 4.01. So B0 is 4.01. Now, what do you do after you've calculate, you've determined B0 and B0 and B1? You can actually figure out B sub E and alpha E. If you remember, okay, you can calculate B sub V as B sub E minus alpha E b plus a half, okay, this expression right here. And these are the numbers that we are able to look up from Hertzberg's table or from the NIST website. Okay, if you're, if you're wondering where did those numbers come from, you can calculate, you can determine those if you knew b1 and b0, okay? Because why, what happens? If I have b1, what do I get? That's b e minus alpha alpha e times 1.5, right? And I have b0 is equal to b e minus alpha e times 0 0.5, okay? I, ha I know two things. I know my b1 and b0, remember? From the analysis, we can determine b1 and b0. So I have two equations in two unknowns. So from these two equations in two unknowns, you can get b sub e and alpha sub e, all right? So that's what you need to do now to get B E and alpha E. Where does the centrifugal distortion constant come from? Well, in that case, you're gonna have to add more terms to your expression for the line position. If you wanna know the, the centrifugal distortion terms, okay, centrifugal distortion constant, you have to add two more columns to your spreadsheet, okay, so go back to your spreadsheet right here. You're going to have to add another column here, column F right here. What would you have here? You're gonna add J prime, J prime plus one squared, and another column of J, prime, J double prime, J double prime plus one squared. So you have two more columns. And so when you do your regression, instead of two columns, you're going to have four columns. And that will give you four coefficients. 
Okay, what's the what's the coefficient of j prime j prime plus one? It's going to be d d one, right? And what's the coefficient of j double prime j double prime plus one? It would, it's going to be d zero. So that allows you to determine the centrifugal distortion constant. And that is something you might have to do if you have a lot of data points. Okay, if you get a lot of uh, spectral lines, then the rigid you'll find that the rigid rotor approximation is not going to be enough. Okay, so uh, in those cases, you're going to have to in incorporate in your calculation the centrifugal distortion. Term. Okay. And finally, you can assess the accuracy of your band origin by just comparing it with the literature value. You look up omega E, omega E, X E, and omega E, Y E, and you can calculate your band origin based on those. It's just G of 1 minus G of 0. So what's G of 1? It's omega E 1.5 right? minus omega E, X E. 1.5 squared plus omega e y e 1.5 cube and then g of 0 is going to be omega e 0.5 minus omega e x e 0.5 squared plus omega e y e 0.5 cubed so you should have enough information now to analyze the infrared spectrum from the lab Okay, so uh, let's take a look at that spectrum. I posted it on Moodle for you. Are we done here? Next question? Yeah. Okay, so if you go to Moodle, Uh, oh, there's a spectrum for your pre-lab that you need to analyze. And then this is the IR spectrum from, for your experiment. Okay. It's all in Excel. So let's download the one from your pre-lab. This is the HCL and the HBR. And part of this is going to, you're going to have to analyze for your post-lab report. So save it. I need permission to access the file. Hmm. I thought I had it set for public access. Okay, let me go ahead and log in to that account. Oh, let's just do the SEO. I'll have to set the permission for that one later. Okay, let's just do the CO. Carbon monoxide, save link as. Oops. File, download. So here's your carbon monoxide spectrum okay, from your. So this is wave numbers over here. That's 20,000 up to 2,000. Up to about, that's a pretty long one, 2,200. It's a lot of data points. Okay, so very high resolution spectrum of carbon monoxide. And what you want to do, okay, so this I've already graphed it for you. What did I just do? You can, so you can see what that spectrum looks like.
All right, so that's what the spectrum looks like. Okay, and if you want to be able to precisely determine where those line positions are, you have to stretch this out so you can see better. Okay, and you can add a grid, a grid to this, and probably a good thing to uh, so let let the plot area have no background. Okay, and then stretch it out as wide as you can. And then let's add a grid to it. Uh, chart, layout, that's in layout. Add grid lines. You want vertical grid lines, minor grid lines. Okay. And you probably want a finer grid line. Okay, smaller spacings between your grid, grid lines so you can see your line positions much better. Much more easily. You can make, read it more easily. Okay. So let's see if we can identify the different parts of this spectrum. Where is the band origin approximately? Okay. Here's 2100, it's 2150, and that's 2200. Where is it at? Somewhere around here, right? So what is this gap approximately equal to? 4B. What's the gap between these two? These approximately? 2B. So based on this, based on this spectrum right here that we have, let's estimate our B value before we even calculate it. So what's our approximate B value? So this 2100, that's 2150, so that's 2110, 2120, 2130, 2140. So 4B is approximately how much? About 8. Yeah, around 8. So that's about 4B, approximately. So B is approximately 2, right? And let's look that up uh, on the NIS, at the NIST website. Um, let's see. Webbook.nist.gov. Let's do a search for carbon monoxide. Constants of the atomic molecule search. Scroll down to the bottom for the X state. What's our B value? 1.93. That's about 2. Okay. But you have to analyze that data. You actually have to pick those numbers. The resolution of that spectrum is 0.25 reciprocal centimeters. So you need to be able to record to the second decimal place those line positions. So what you need, what you can do is, you can just select your axis range to whatever wavelength you're look, whatever whatever peak you're looking at. Stretch it out as much as you can. Put a lot of grid lines behind it so you can determine it to the nearest second decimal. Okay, hundreds of a reciprocal centimeter. So you need to tabulate those, identify the R lines, the P lines, J prime, J double prime for each of those spectral lines. So let's look at, okay, where's the first R line? So if this is your band origin right here, this is omega naught, where's the first R line? Right or left? Okay, this is increasing. So if you have increasing wave numbers, R is on the right, right? So this is your P branch. This is your R branch on the right. So what's the J, what's J prime here? What's J double prime and what's J prime? First R line, J double prime is zero, J prime is one. And this is J double prime equals 1, J prime equals 2. For this one, that's your first P line, J 
j double prime in this case is 1 and j prime is 0. And then this one, what would that be? j double prime equals 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and so on. Okay? And uh, if someone could remind me, I need by email, I, I need to change the permission for that HCL spectrum so you can all download it because you're going to need it for your post lab report also. There's HCL there and there's HBR. You need to be able to identify which one is HCL 37, which one is HCL 35, and which one is HBR.